here we go. We were so we were looking at the art and let me um normally I end up I think doing definite integrals in indefinite integrals in class just because the antiderivative is really most of the work once you found the antiderivative of something, plugging into numbers and subtracting them is merely tedious. But just for variety, if And because students asked for more uh, challenging problems and for emails, let's go ahead and look at a uh, arc tangent problem that's also a definite integral. Now, having said that, I'm going back to what I said just a few minutes ago. The real issue here is the indefinite integral. Once we found this, plugging in zero, plugging in one, subtracting them. I mean, it's tedious, but it's not uh, mechanically challenging. I already mentioned our tangent, so it's not like a secret, but um, the method we'll be using for this integral. I want to use the fact that one divided by one plus x squared dx as a node and the derivative. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this looks a lot like the R tangent. Um, we're off by some constants. We have that two up there that we don't want. We have that three down there that we don't want, but this looks very much like an R tangent. And one of those things I mentioned is, is a trivial problem to resolve. This two can just pull out of the integral. So as far as having a two up there that we don't want, that's, that's not an issue. This three can't go out of the integral. And yesterday I probably treated that as if it were obvious, but maybe it isn't. Um, we can pull constants out of integrals when we're multiplying by the constant. So this integral here is the same as two times one, over three plus x squared dx. And because we have this multiplication, that two can just pull out here. That's not what we have here. We have addition in the denominator of a fraction. It's not multiplication, so we can't just pull that three out in the same way that we pulled the two out. And the trick here, I mean, it's sort of good news, bad news. I mean, the good news is that it's pretty mechanical. I mean, all of these problems are done in very similar ways. Is um, the bad news is that it is tedious. It's it's no use pretending it isn't tedious. It's got a lot of picky little steps where you might make 
some kind of error. But the trick here, the trick is actually very similar to U substitution. I didn't say that yesterday, but I've been thinking about that. We want a three, a one instead of a three. If we pulled a three out, we'd get a one. The issue though, is that X squared doesn't have a three in front of it. If we had, if we had three plus three X squared, we'd be golden. We'd pull three out from both those terms and we'd have exactly what we want. But we don't have a three. We just have an X squared. Let me write that over here. And now this is the part that's very similar to U substitution. When we're doing U substitution, if we're missing a constant we want, we can just put that constant in. But we also divide by that constant so as not to change anything. So we can pull a three out now. The cost is that we now have that one third X squared. So if that step yesterday wasn't totally clear, maybe this is a little clearer. <laughs> And when we have multiplication, I mean, because X squared is X squared divided by one, and you multiply the top of fractions and you multiply the bottom of fractions. This is X squared divided by three. I'm going to erase that uh, intermediate step, everything here. Does everybody have this written who wants it written? All righty. And that three, um, we don't want it, or maybe we will want it, I don't know, but, um, but ultimately, I mean, if we're going to use this formula, though, we just want one plus our variable squared in the denominator. I think yesterday when we did this, I pulled the variable out and then we ended up wanting it after all, but I'm going to take that three and I'm going to pull it out. And the two things here, it's going into the denominator of that two because it's in the denominator over here. And again, the reason we can do this here we had addition, we couldn't pull the three out. We've rewritten this as multiplication. So now we can pull the three out. These are um, 
these are always going to be some kind of U substitution at the end, or always is a strong word, I guess, but usually these are going to be some kind of U substitution at the end. So, I mean, the point of U substitution, again, is if we can get this to look like one plus U squared DU, then we can just, just always in scare quotes, but we can use the arctangent formula. So our goal that we would like to accomplish is to rewrite that, to pick some u so that x squared over three is u squared. And of course, there's also the issue, although this won't come up, um, we need our choice of U to be such that the U shows up. So but, um, but that's never going to be, well, again, never is a strong word, but with most of these problems, that won't be an issue. Let me give myself plenty of space <laughs> to work with. So maybe yesterday I fell into the step of into the error of just kind of doing the stuff that I knew would work without trying to talk about the thought process behind it. We want to have a square here, and we already have x squared. We know, I mean, we probably know this is the kind of thing we learn as children and then maybe we never use it again and therefore we forget it. But when we're young, we learn that having a power in the top and the power in the bottom of a fraction is the same as having that fraction to the power. So if instead of three, we had three square, I mean, we don't, but if instead of three, we had three squared, we'd be golden. We could say, okay, this is x divided by three squared. The obvious problem with that, I mean, if wishes for horses, right? We don't have the square. We can't just wish it into existence. But we can say, Okay, well, every positive number can be written as a square. In particular, every positive number is its square root squared. So this is x squared divided by a number squared. It's just that that number is unfortunately not uh, not very nice. It's just, I mean, the square root of three is some infinite non-repeating decimal. It's an ugly number, but it is a number.
And as such, we can write this fraction as a square. Maybe this goes without saying, but maybe it doesn't. I mean, our ultimate goal, as we stated it, we've got these limits of integration. I am not even thinking of those at the moment. At the very end, once we have the antiderivative, we can stick those numbers in and subtract them. But two thirds times at the moment, we're taking the indefinite integral. And this looks, this looks so close to being the arctangent. One divided by one plus something squared dx. And here is where this problem will turn into a U substitution problem. We're going to let U be X divided by the square root of three. And we are going to turn this into one over one plus U squared by a U substitution. <clears throat> Is everybody, I mean, we have these sort of long problems where I guess four frames in, but they're pretty dense frames. Before we sort of get to the nitty gritty, you know, plugging numbers in and stuff, does anybody have any questions about the step <laughs> yeah. we have taken to go from here to here? If not, then of course, U substitution isn't as simple as just saying, oh, I don't want that. I'll rename it to you. U substitution has two parts. You've got your U, but you've also got your DU. And DU is the derivative of U. And I mean, we should not be, we should not be using the quotient rule here. I mean, unless you like wasting time, um, x over the square root of three is one over the square root of three times x. So the derivative of this, the derivative of a constant times x, is the constant. And we don't have that. I mean, we've got the dx, that's all very well, but this one over the square root of three, we do not have. Well, this is a problem we've run into many times by now. Hopefully we're starting to internalize the solution, <clears throat> which is that if you need a constant and you don't have the constant, you can put a constant in as long as you also divide by it. And I'm doing a little algebra mentally here. One divided by one divided by the square root of three is just a very 
straightforward way of writing the square root of three. If you take this fraction and you clear the denominator, you wind up just with the square root of three. Just to try to keep our keep our problem in me. And let me make sure that we do not run our work into the stuff we have written. So we're missing a one over square root of three, not a real problem because one over the square root of three is a constant. We put it in, we also put the square root in. It's, it's great. Um, and then we, and now we just have, just have this fraction, one divided by one plus x over the square root of three squared dx. Oof, this isn't very nice looking, but actually we're very close to the end. This is much, uh, much nicer than it might appear at first glance. What's going to happen? That square root of three is a constant. It's going to pull up. So we're going to have two and we're going to have, sorry, I try to keep above the table level, but hopefully everyone can read this. We pull that square root of three out. Now this one over the square root of three and this dx, is going to change, thank you, Zoom, is going to change into du. X over the square root of three is u. So at the end of the day, there is our integral. We've had to we've had to fight to uh, to get us here, but but this is now an integral that we just know, and regrettably, I know that. I mean, I try to keep memorization down because I know memorizing lists of um, lists of integrals is certainly no one's idea of fun, but you should know the R tangent. Um, of the three inverse trig functions that we learn, the arc tangent is the most famous and the most important. And we're very close to being done. In fact, the only thing that remains is that we have the arc tangent of u. And what's u? We don't want u, our variable is x. Well, u is x divided by the square root of three. I remember what color we were using. I think maybe this one. Uh, 
So that that was an ugly problem. These problems are all ugly. Um, I guess that's a pretty uh, unencouraging thing to hear your professor say. It's true, though. I'll get the quiz up tonight, probably, but because these problems are so long, I'll push the due date of this one a few days back. Lobatow's rules up, it's due Sunday. But that's what we, I'm saying that as if we've finished this problem. We haven't finished this problem. This was a definite integral. So let's finish this problem. The integral was from one to two. And we found this antiderivative this simplifies a little if you are so inclined, but wait, not yeah, that would have really simplified. This simplifies. A little, if you're so inclined. Um, I mean, this is two times three to the one half divided by three to the first. You subtract the powers. So this is two times three to the negative one half. So two divided by the square root of three. I guess in a very real sense, it doesn't matter. Our calculator isn't going to care whether we give it a simplified expression or not. In any case, whether you simplify that or not, you've got the arc tangent. And then you've got x divided by the square root of three. And because this is a definite integral, we don't need that constant of integration. I might, I mean, it, your calculator, properly speaking, won't Air, but just to reduce the number of button presses, let's do that simplification we discussed. And say, okay, that's two over the square root of three. So, two divided by the square root of three <clears throat> times memory of a goldfish. We're taking this, we're plugging in one, we're plugging in zero. So the arc tangent of one over the square root of three, our calculator uses different notation, but this is the arc tangent. One divided by the square root of three, Minus, I believe the arc tangent, wrong button. I believe the arc tangent of zero is zero. So, I mean, zero divided by the square root of three is zero. 
the arc tangent of zero is zero, but I'm just I'm just entering it as it appeared on the board. Yeah. And we get at last our answer. Zero point six zero four six. Again, your quiz on the quiz, you're going to be seeing a lot of definite integrals just because asking, I mean, typing that in as an answer is much easier than trying to learn a latex and, and typing this in as an answer. <laughs> So that's two out of three of the uh, inverse trig functions that I want to cover. And honestly, it's more like 2.5 out of three. I don't want to dwell on the third one. So we might end up, might end up uh, adjourning a little early today, but... Again, I mean, as far as seeing an application of this, I hope we can. It depends on how I want to be done with integrals before midterm break. So it all just depends on how much time we have before midterm break. But again, I mean, you can't, it's very easy to create examples. where one plus squared shows up. And the easiest examples are right triangles. Um, if you have a uh, vagus of one and x, that one plus x squared is going to appear in the hypotenuse. And um, an application of this stuff is falling, objects falling without air resistance, or rather with air resistance. And you can sort of see how, I mean, up falling objects are moving vertically. This X is a vertical distance. You can maybe kind of see that something that looks like this might show up in those problems. The, the last one that I want to do is is definitely the ugliest and also the hardest to work with. The derivative of the arc secant is extremely strange looking because it has an absolute value in it. And no other derivative that we've seen has had an absolute value in it. That being said, in a lot of real world situations, your variable is positive. And the absolute value of a positive number is positive. So in a lot of real world situations, this absolute value isn't actually doing anything. And you can just delete it from the derivative. I mean, if x is greater than zero, 
the derivative of the arc secant looks less a over If x is greater than zero, you don't have to have that absolute value. The arc secant is hardest to work with. And it's hardest to work with because the variable appears twice. I mean, again, as alien as this might kind of look, this shows up, come on, Zoom. As alien as this might look, that square root of x squared minus one shows up when you're using the Pythagorean theorem, just like the other two. If we didn't have this x here, this would um this would be something that clearly shows up when you're looking at right triangles, because we do have that X applications are a little harder to intuit. And in fact, we can be, we can be honest here. I've seen applications of the arc tangent. I've seen applications of the arc side. I've never actually seen an application of the arc secant. I'm kind of taking the textbook at its word when the textbook says that this material is important. But then again, I mean, who knows? There's so much applications I've never seen, never taken an engineering course, never taken a high level physics course. So, I mean, mostly I think I just want to state the definition of the arc secant. All of these, I mean, all of these problems we're doing are basically the same. You pull something out, you do a U substitution. Um, it's good to see this. It's also good. So one of the reasons out to this two can be more difficult than count to this one is that it's so, so sort of all the techniques we learn are dedicated. Like, let me just sort of throw two examples on the board. None of these examples are going to be a long examples. Two over one plus x squared dx. This looks like an arc tangent. And it is an arc tangent. That two is a constant, it pulls out what's left. is the integral of the arc tangent. Great, example two. So example two looks a lot like example one. But in fact, it's a totally different type of problem that's resolved in a totally different way. Example two is a U substitution problem. If you let U be one plus X squared, DU is two X DX. X. 
And this is resolved. Without the arc tangent. And I want to bring this up because when I like grade tests and stuff, like I feel like half of the trouble students have in calculus this too is they'll try something what they try doesn't work. And then rather than try something else, they just try to kind of force their first idea through, even though their first idea isn't working. Like a student will see this problem, their first idea will be a U substitution. U substitution doesn't work here because we don't have an X. And rather than just admit that and start again, um, what I see a lot in tests is students just trying to make it work. What if we multiply by X and then divide by X? What if we, and there's nothing you can do here to make you substitution work. And in fairness to the students of the past, I mean, I think that might be as much time pressure as anything else. I didn't used to give a lot of take home tests. If you have five minutes to do a problem, the first thing that you do doesn't work. Now you have two minutes to do the problem. It's difficult to just admit that nothing you've done has been helpful. Start over and try again. But you really need to be able to do that in a calculus class. And I think one of the advantages of giving take home tests is to hopefully enable students to to do stuff like that, to try something, see that it's not working, and then try something else. And that little lecture has brought us fairly close to the end, well, to 9 to 8.50, which I usually treat as the end of the class. So, We'll uh, call this here. This section's done. I mean, there are all sorts of little sneaky little examples we could do. I don't have much patience for sneaky examples. I think show the important stuff and be content with that.